So welcome back, everyone. And it's time to start the afternoon session. And it's my great pleasure to do so by introducing Coran uh, Heinemann, who will speak about time discounting. Please, Coran. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks very much for organizing this wonderful workshop. I already learned a lot. Uh, this is uh, the tutorial on uh, time discounting. Um, it's going to be a, a little bit different from, from what we've seen so far. It's going to be a bit more conceptual uh, and less formal. And um, it's also uh, a bit of a different topic. And I'm, I'm sure you've all uh, seen uh, discount rates somewhere in models that you've uh, worked with. Uh, time discounting as a topic is, is fairly well known for how controversial it is. Uh, at the same time, the, uh, uh, the literature, but also the community of people who study this is uh, fairly uh, disenfranchised and fairly small. So uh, it's also going to be a little bit of an advertisement uh, to get more people interested in, uh, uh, in working on this, on this topic also from, from a more formal point of view, uh, uh, as I hope to show uh, this topic really needs, uh, needs uh, some, some help from, from people like you. Um, right, so uh, what I want to do is uh, firstly speak a little bit about intertemporal decision making in general to, to ease us into uh, uh, the more specific question of, of what time discounting is, how it can be justified, uh, how, how it can be formally derived and, and so on. Um, and then uh, uh, just talk about the uh, popular discounted utility model uh, and a few other uh, uh, discounting models in, in, uh, in, a bit more, in a bit more detail. So, but first let's, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, inter intertemporal decisions in, in general. So, so this is uh, Rotterdam. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of water. Uh, Rotterdam uh, is fairly close to the North Sea, and in fact, it lies seven meters below sea level. So technically, uh, you, sh you should uh, probably see a lot less of, of it than you, than you see now. Um, and uh, so what's, uh, what's interesting here is that um, as, uh, as a city that is uh, so close to water and uh, technically under, under sea level, uh, there's a couple of interesting choices to make. So here we have... Um, uh, here we have uh, the, the, the mayor uh, of Rotterdam, Ahmed uh, Abu Taleb, and so he now has this choice whether he can, uh, he spends uh, hundreds of millions of uh, euros now to make uh, Rotterdam a climate-proof city, uh, installing uh, a better sea barrier, develop floating housing estates, uh, designated flooding areas and things like that, or he can just sort of build us a nice uh, swimming pool or, or extend the opening hours of the ice skating ring and so on. Um, and, and so the idea being here that he's, he's, he has a choice between spending money now on this uh, climate change problem uh, or simply leaving it uh, uh, for, for later. And of course, in the short run, it's much more agreeable to uh, dip into the swimming pool, but then maybe in the long run, it's not so nice if there's rather more water. Um, so, so that's that's one intertemporal choice, uh, and and you, you'd, I mean, you could find you could find many examples that uh, work along similar lines. So here's an, here's another one that's going to get. So we're kind of increasing the complexity of the choice a little bit. So here we have uh, a twofold choice. So we ask an agent uh, to choose between uh, receiving one apple today and two apples tomorrow. Uh, and after having made that choice, we ask that same agent again uh, uh, whether they'd prefer uh, one apple in 999 days uh, or two apples in 1,000 days. And so declaring indifference is not, a, not an option here, and so we need two answers from that agent. Now, you, you have seen that the trade-off uh, between time and apples is roughly the same in these two choices, right? So there's sort of uh, uh, one apple... Uh, if you wait one day, you get an apple more, but uh, uh, what's interesting to note, uh, and, and I'm sure some of you have seen these kinds of results, is that in empirical studies, uh, it's shown that a lot of people prefer the one apple today and then say, I go for the two apples in 1,000 days. Uh, problem being that after 999 days, uh, you have a preference reversal, because on that day, uh, you'd rather like that one apple according to your earlier preference. So. So, so not only do we have, like in the first, uh, in the first uh, example, we have these sort of different moments at which, op I mean, at which outcomes realize and, and at which you enjoy utility, we also have a uh, dynamic aspect to the problem here. Um, and then so finally, uh, a slightly more dynamic problem. So here's a, here's a familiar situation. Um, uh, so suppose you have a busy academic, and that busy academic has a lot of drafts sitting in her office. So there's uh, students having delivered drafts of papers, her colleagues' drafts, her own drafts. So there's always drafts, right? Um, 
but then on the other uh, on the other hand, there's also draft beer. Uh, so suppose this colleague sitting in the office and uh, uh, wants to go through all these drafts, and then a colleague pops in and says, "Well, you know, let's go down to the bar uh, and have some drinks." And then the colleague says, "No, I have all these manuscripts, uh, all these drafts to go through." Uh, and then the colleague says, "But maybe just one drink, right?" Uh, and then you think about this, and then you realize, "Well, what's going to happen if I go for one drink?" probably I'm going then to face the choice to have uh, rather a few more drinks uh, or sort of go home and work on my drafts. And so what happens then is that you, you sit here and you, you see projecting, uh, 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 projecting this, kind of, uh, this kind of decision tree, you then think, well, maybe I should, uh, uh, should just uh, stay in my office and work on, on these drafts rather than, uh, oops, rather than um, working uh, rather than working on, on these other drafts up here. So, so these, are, I mean, these are just three examples of intertemporal decisions, and, and they, they are very different from each other. Um, and so one aim of this talk is also to say, okay, we have this tool of time discounting, um, and uh, what kinds of things can we uh, uh, say with this tool about these kinds of decisions? Uh, uh, surely, uh, it would be great if time discounting functions would deliver uh, all out evaluations of all these uh, situations and simply uh, uh, capture everything uh, uh, about intertemporal decision making that we that we want to capture it 's not going to work out uh, quite like that um, so but uh, before we delve into the uh, specific accounts, let, let me uh, say a few things about, uh, uh, about time discounting in general. So where, where does the concept uh, come from or what does the concept uh, consist in, in in general? So we all know discounts. Uh, you know, discount is always good news. Uh, uh, so a discount is something you get. There's a specific reason the store has to close. There's a seasonal change or something like that. And so time discounting, the idea is that um, because of time, whatever that means, uh, we introduce discounting. So uh, what most accounts of time discounting imply is that uh, suppose we have a good, be that a material good or be that the result of a goodness evaluation. Uh, so we have uh, a goodness evaluation of a prospect or, or a good in our hands um, uh, that we can combine this kind of evaluation with time indexed weights. So for every point in time, we get a weight and we apply that weight to how good we think that prospect was in the first place. So note that uh, what's most common here is that present events are given the full weight, so we, we, want, to, we want to give the present the full, the full weight of, of one, and then future events are slightly deva uh, uh, devalued. So this is also, so I'm kind of trying to build up a, a sort of a target for, for what we have to provide foundations for, right? So commonly, this is, what uh, people want when they engage in time discounting. They want to give us these time indexed weights and they want to weight the present uh, with the full weight. Um, and the theory of time discounting presumably has to tell us uh, how that works and, and why that is. So, uh, so here's, here's how, it, uh, how it looks like uh, a bit more specifically. So here we have time and here we have a discounting uh, factor and so zero gets assigned one and then you have all sorts of different proposals for time discounting functions that somehow uh, uh, flatten out over, uh, over time. So to just give you, so this is all just uh, for, for getting into it a little bit. Uh, so, so, so for instance, the familiar exponential discounting is just this one discounting factor here uh, to the power of t, and this is, where, where, this is how this uh, discounting function is, uh, is generated. Um, you, may have, you may be familiar with the concept of a discount rate, so that where you, you uh, plug the rate into this 1 over 1 plus r term, and that gives you then the discounting factor. There's other ways to get discounting factors. You can just, uh, so this is a favorite, uh, you just do 1 over t, and that's, that's going to deliver a, uh, uh, a falling function of the right kind. And then there are all sorts of proposals which are called hyperbolic discounting uh, uh, with different parametrizations uh, for, for how the curve is going to look like. So this is, this is what we have here in this graph that all these functions uh, behave rather differently here in terms of how, 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 uh, uh, how smooth they are and how, how quickly they, they flatten out. So, 
so maybe it's it's time to 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 uh, before we getting into all these details about what's the right kind of discounting function maybe it's it's also good to take stock uh, in terms of what have these functions in common and so here's here's what i take to be uh, a broad enough church for 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 most uh, discounting theories or most uh, uh, most approaches to time discounting and it's a general time discounting function of the following sort uh, so we have a set of time points from from the present the zero uh, 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 up to infinity, and then we have uh, a mapping, a decreasing mapping into a real interval uh, where the uh, time point uh, zero gets assigned the full weight, the one, um, and, uh, and then we have a decreasing mapping for the time points afterwards. So most functions actually, uh, for most discounting functions that we've just seen before, you can say it's uh, uh, strictly decreasing, uh, but there's also some for which is only uh, weakly, uh, uh, weakly uh, decreasing. So that's why I'm here a little bit uh, uh, open, what I, what I say with weekly and, uh, and strictly. Most, uh, most accounts in the literature are actually strictly decreasing mapping, but there are a few uh, that, uh, that sometimes uh, have uh, weekly decreasing parts as well. So, so this, is, this is a useful, this is a useful uh, thing to, to keep in mind. It seems that what time discounting theories want is they want to motivate uh, this kind of function. Ideally, they want to derive it. Ideally, this function should predict well. Uh, and ideally, it also has a nice conceptual motivation. So let's see how far we uh, get with that. So keeping in mind this function, then there's a few other questions we should ask. So one is, of course, well, what's the object and domain of discounting? So what are we actually discounting? We have this, uh, we've just seen we have this time discounting function, and now the question is to what sort of object and uh, uh, to what sort of situation is it applied to? Um, Discounting is used in, for many different objects. I mean, most, mostly, I mean, you will be from sort of daily life. You will be mostly familiar with uh, uh, the discounting of monetary amounts according to uh, according to some interest rate. Um, but uh, we can, of course, talk about discounting of utility, which which I will focus most on uh, today. Uh, and uh, we can also talk about well, should we discount happiness? Can we discount natural resources? Uh, so there can be different objects of discounting, and. Um, and that's important to be to be clear about because uh, the next questions we're gonna, going to ask is well, what is our motivation for discounting? Why would we do time discounting? And then also we're going to ask well, what's the correct discounting functions? How should we discount? Um, and so the answers to these two questions are going to of course depend on uh, uh, on, on what sort of object we want to uh, want to apply these uh, these uh, uh, these weights to. So. Uh, there's, uh, as you may be aware, there's uh, tons of controversy both in economics uh, uh, and philosophy, but also in policy making about time discounting, about the right kind of time discounting, whether it's rational or not, uh, how do we describe it and how do we predict it. Um, and so before we, we get into the details, I just have, so I've collected a few uh, uh, favorite uh, quotes on, on time discounting to just kind of show you the range of very strong positions uh, uh, that, that, that are out there uh, uh, on this topic. So here we have uh, one classic, so this is John Rawls channel channeling uh, Sidgwick, um, and he says, well, the mere difference of location and time of some things being earlier or later is not a rational ground for having more or less regard for it. Right? So he says, uh, you know, just because something is timed differently, there would be no way in which we would want to have that. So he would actually not endorse time discounting, or at least that's what he's, what he's uh, trying to tell us. And, and this is a common position amongst, uh, amongst philosophers, that we would simply say the discounting uh, of utility in particular uh, uh, is simply something which, uh, which we, which we uh, find hard to, uh, to see as rational in some sense. So that's one important position that, uh, 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 to, to keep in mind. Um, so secondly, here we have uh, Frank Ramsey, uh, who, who's been doing some, some early work in, in, uh, in providing some foundations for, for discounting. And so I think this is uh, my single most favorite quote on time discounting because it, uh, in one sentence, encapsulates uh, all the problems that, that there are with, with time discounting. So he says, it is assumed that we do not discount later enjoyments in comparison with earlier ones, a practice which is ethically indefensible. We shall, however, include such a rate of discount in some of our investigations. So I, I think this, this is something that you, that you uh, can, see, uh, can see quite often, that uh, if you really press 
uh, uh, the issue of can we really discount utility, can we really discount uh, uh, happiness uh, uh, in, in some sense, can we count can we discount uh, the uh, happiness or utility of future people? Uh, uh, many would say, no, we can't really do this. But then if you sit down and you write down your model, then it becomes very inconvenient if you can't discount. Uh, so so these are, there, there are also things that pull us in different directions here. Mm -hmm. And it's also something very early. So here we have, uh, 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 here we have uh, uh, something uh, a little bit older. So here, if anyone says, yes, Socrates, but immediate pleasure differs widely from future pleasure and pain, to that I should reply, and do they differ in anything but pleasure and pain? There can be no other measure of them. So, so this is interesting because it's not as dr drastic. Uh, 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 we, we're not getting to hear that uh, we, we can't do time discounting, but rather, well, if you, if you express time discounting in something which, uh, which supposedly matters ethically, then maybe there's a, there's a chance. And then finally, we're, we're sort of going all in in terms of really also justifying discounting ethically. We have Derek Parfit who says, well, my concern for my future may correspond to the degree of connectedness between me now and myself in the future. Uh, since connectedness is nearly always weaker over long periods, I can rationally care less about my further uh, future and hence uh, discount. So, so we, we have a number of, of fairly strong uh, uh, ethical positions, but also methodological uh, uh, remarks on time discounting here. And I just want to uh, uh, make one distinction before, before uh, getting into, uh, into the more detailed uh, accounts, and that is uh, to, um, without endorsing a strict distinction between descriptive and normative uh, uh, theorizing, uh, say that these two questions of, well, why do we discount and how do we discount of course, we would understand them differently if our concerns are primarily descriptive and uh, if, if our concerns are primarily normative. So in a descriptive vein, if, if somebody asks me, well, why, you know, why do we discount? Well, I mean, what I would want my theory of time discounting to, to return to me is a motivation that is close to what, uh, uh, what individual decision makers or the decision makers under investigation of what they engage in. Um, so presumably this, this, uh, uh, there, there should be something uh, that is captured in this time discounting function uh, that, that really happens in, in, uh, in real life. Um, and likewise, for, for how do you discount, we've seen already the different discounting function. Well, what you'd want is you want empirically adequate uh, 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 predict what, uh, what the discounting behavior is going to, going to be like. And so in the normative uh, vein, if you ask, well, why do you discount, you're basically asking, well, why is it rational to discount? Um, we've we've uh, seen this morning uh, a lot of uh, careful work being reviewed about how we derive uh, uh, utility functions and uh, uh, probability functions. And so why would I come in and uh, add another function to that if it's not very, very well justified? Um, uh, and likewise, also, if, you, if we ask, well, how, you know, if you must do so, how would you do it? Well, hopefully you have an adequate representation theorem uh, backing that up. So it seems to me that, that this is a useful, uh, uh, this is sort of a useful a table of desiderata of theories of time discounting to, uh, to keep in mind, especially because, the, uh, 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 because there are so many ways in which, uh, in which our intuitions can be, be pulled in different directions when we, when we think about uh, individual examples uh, of, uh, uh, of time discounting and these, uh, these uh, uh, examples I've, uh, I've given you uh, earlier. Right. So then, let's uh, let's start by reviewing the the, the standard uh, the standard way in which discounting is done in, in, in economics. And so this is what's called the so-called discounted utility model. Um, and so this was initially proposed by Samuelson in uh, '37, uh, and then axiomatized uh, uh, later on by by several different authors. So what happens here in the DU model is that we get uh, this concept of time preference introduced. Uh, uh, to deal with the subjective evaluation of intertemporal prospects. So the way this works is that um, usually what we do is we introduce evaluation on some set of outcomes, uh, uh, so that gives us a utility function. Um, and so now what we do is we get time preferences that compare prospects that are combinations of outcomes and time. So the domain of preference becomes uh, uh, the cross product of outcomes and time, and the time preferences over this domain can then be numerically represented as discounted utility. 
So, so that's the, that's the key, key uh, move that discounted utility introduces here, that we get, these, uh, uh, that we get this, uh, this different uh, domain of preferences and that we extend the description of these and make the timing of the outcome uh, we, are, uh, we are looking at a separate uh, explicit issue in the, in the derivation of the, of the function. And so here's an easy way to do this. Uh, so the easy way is if you assume that your outcome set X is already valued. Uh, so, so that sort of assumes away a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of technicalities and uh, allows us to focus on, uh, uh, on, on some of the conceptual issues a little bit more. Um, so what you, if you have such a, what's called a price time structure, you can then say, okay, I've valued outcomes uh, 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 which are given a time, and we have a preference relation on pairs of time points and prices. And then what we are asking, basically, we're asking to, to uh, uh, find out what kind of axioms can we put on this preference relation over time, uh, uh, price time pairs uh, in order to, to, get a, uh, to get a representation. Uh, so here's, here's how that works in uh, Fishburne and Rubinstein's uh, 80, 82 model. So this is the, I think this is the, probably the easiest uh, uh, derivation of, of time discounting that we have. So as you can see, most of these axioms are quite, uh, uh, they're quite uh, familiar in terms of uh, what, we know from, uh, uh, what we know from standard uh, uh, rational choice theory, standard decision theory. So we have uh, the relation satisfying weak order as a monotonicity condition. Uh, and a continuity condition, and the two conditions that uh, uh, are really something where we not just extend what we've already wanted to say about outcomes, uh, but really say something new um, are, uh, are the time impatience and the stationarity conditions. So time, the time impatience axiom says, if you take a time point S that is earlier than a time point T, then whenever I have a positively valued outcome, I'd want it earlier than, uh, rather than later, if I have a neutrally uh, valued outcome, I don't care when I, or I'm indifferent over, over the timing of uh, receiving it. And if uh, uh, I have a negatively valued outcome, then uh, uh, I'd rather uh, uh, delay, uh, 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 delay getting this. So the idea is here that something good we want earlier, something we don't care about, we don't care about when we get it, and something bad we want to push, uh, uh, push to, to, the, to the future. That, that's, the, that's the basic intuition behind this, this axiom. Um, then there's the stationarity condition. So this is, uh, 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 this is uh, something where we introduce a time, uh, a time difference and we demand that indifferences between price time pairs can be shifted through time with no change. So in other words, we say, if I have an X, an outcome X at time T and I'm indifferent over, uh, uh, y at t plus uh, uh, a little factor, then I should also be indifferent uh, over x and y if that happens at a, at a different time point. Um, so if there's, if there's a certain time price trade-off uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that makes me indifferent, uh, then I can move that uh, through, uh, through time. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, let's see. Um, right, so, so, I mean, as I said already, the key conceptual assumptions uh, in this framework really are the conditions of time and patience and stationarity. So uh, time and patience say, says agents prefer to receive uh, positive utility uh, uh, earlier and negative utility later. Um, and the stationarity condition says that um, an indifference between two time-dependent outcomes depends only on the d difference between the times and not on the actual uh, time points uh, uh, S and uh, S and T, and so what what we have, I mean, together these constraints then uh, mean that we can represent this the preference relation over over uh, price time pairs uh, by a discounted utility function. So uh, we get uh, we get uh, a a utility function that uh, that that looks like this. So we have the discounting factor here and the utility here, and, and so. If I prefer x at t over y at s, then uh, this term is bigger than the other term. And so what, we, what we're given here is we're given a normal, a normal interval scale utility function uh, and we're given a, uh, 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 we're given a time discounting factor uh, uh, delta that is, uh, that is constant. So that is, 
that is a, a rather, I mean, it's a rather simple way to derive it because, I mean, half of the work uh, we've assumed uh, we've done already, and so there are uh, more thorough derivations of discounted utility around where you uh, don't assume you're working in the price time space, but rather where you say there's a timed stream of outcomes, and these outcomes are now evaluated. And so uh, there is a very nice paper by Bleichwood, Rode, and uh, Wacker, uh, 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 who um, simplify and generalize the initial Koopmans 1960 uh, discounted utility representation. And so what they do is they say uh, we introduce programs. So these are consumption programs, and then so these are not already evaluated prices, but these, these are programs that, uh, uh, that are ordered. And, and so these timed programs then become the object uh, of preference. And what we get is uh, we get a, an equivalent statement that we say, okay, we have discounted utility uh, uh, or we have, uh, we have the time preference uh, satisfying a number of axioms. Some of those uh, channel, uh, channel standard axioms on uh, uh, where we don't isolate the time domains um, and others, uh, uh, others capture what we've just seen. So its stationarity is, uh, uh, looks a lot like it looked in the simple case we've just seen. And then uh, uh, impatience is uh, split up in this sensitivity of the first period condition and in this initial trade of independence. And constant equivalence and tail robustness, these are topological conditions that you, that you need because uh, uh, you, you really have to do the two, jobs, uh, the two jobs at once. But so this is, this is mainly by way of illustrating that, uh, that if, you, uh, if you really want to do it thoroughly, then, uh, then things get obviously a bit more complicated. But uh, the idea is that, uh, that uh, what's conceptually interesting or also problematic about uh, the discounted utility model, we can already see in the, in the, price, time, uh, in the price time structure with the time impatience and uh, the... Uh, 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 and the uh, stationarity uh, uh, axiom. So you have a question? Yeah, so just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, it's thinking about the Samuelson model. Yeah. So obviously the, the utilities that are functions, the prices, they're at least yeah. the Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 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 This. Is, yeah. So that, thanks. That's that's helpful. So I, so this is what I mean when I say that, that, that this is. Um, so when I say that this is sort of the easy derivation of discounted utility because we already assume that these uh, that these are that these are utilities and that we then just sort of order utilities according to uh, when we receive them. Um, and, and so that, uh, I mean, as it turns out, that's, that's, we still have to have this time impatience and stationarity conditions, which are conceptually the, the most uh, uh, interesting ones. And if you go to this, uh, uh, this more thorough framework where you do everything at once, uh, then you have to have a bunch of much more complicated uh, uh, assumptions in order to, to do this. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, so it. I mean, so it. It does. Uh, I mean, so what's what's interesting about this representation is that. So this looks. It. It, it looks like a very mild condition that we. We just have to shift. We just have to shift. Uh, uh, indifferent. We have to be able to shift indifference. Uh, over the uh, uh, through time. So if I'm if I'm a difference between x and y, uh, if x happens at t and y happens a little later than t, if that's if that's my indifference, then I have to sh be able to shift that indifference uh, uh, to all other uh, uh, to all other time points s uh, as long as I keep the same difference. Uh, so it, it looks maybe not like a very strong condition, but actually. Uh, it, it, it is because, uh, so it's also, I mean, it's hiding a few, so just because it's, uh, I, I think it's nice that it's uh, expressed in terms of indifference uh, because then it makes it very easy to understand, but of course you have to, if you combine it with the time impatience, that really also means that uh, 
all sorts of other trade-offs uh, that you may have, and also those that uh, that uh, have that imply strong time preferences. Uh, yeah, that they will also have to be uh, uh, that you can also shift them through uh, through time. Right. So, but so that's that's in a sense. So, so, but that's in a sense, I mean, all the technicality we need to worry a lot about what's going on. Uh, uh, because, so, I mean, one thing, this is just simply uh, historically interesting, is that uh, Samuelson, the 37, uh, and Koopmans, 1960, which are responsible for this result, in a sense, they didn't endorse it at, this at all in terms of... Uh, 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 they said, well, this is maybe a mathematically interesting result, uh, but uh, so Samuelson, uh, 39, he says explicitly, this doesn't have any empirical uh, uh, and normative significance. I mean, he really, he really says it very, very clearly. Uh, and then the next thing you know is that uh, uh, this is the standard method of time discounting in, in economic theory. So, uh, uh, and so, so the, the question is a little bit, why is that? Well, I mean, the most important formal property of exponential discounting, when you have this uh, 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 one discounting factor, is that it dynamically preserves the utility function. So uh, what that means is that in this, uh, this uh, Apple example from the, from the beginning, if you're, uh, you can discount it, but if you're an exponential discounter, uh, you're not going to uh, fall into the trap of the preference uh, reversal. Uh, and so, so if you're discounting hyperbolically, you, you will come up with the preference uh, reversal or hyperbolic discounting uh, will, will capture it, but exponential discounting uh, uh, will, will make sure that you, that you don't have these kinds of, um, these kinds of uh, preference reversals. And I, and I, I take it that that's, that's, probably what's, uh, uh, that's probably what's behind the enduring uh, appeal of exponential time discounting. And also, I mean, it's very simple uh, and I mean, it's just a, a nice smooth curve that you can plug into uh, uh, a great deal of uh, models. And so thinking a little bit about this, right, so what we want to do now is we want to say, okay, uh, we have this discounted utility model which, uh, 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 which motivates time discounting by time preference. So how do time preferences fare with regards to our uh, our four desiderata, that's a little bit the question now. So what, what do time preferences really capture the motivation in a descriptive sense of why individuals discount? Uh, is, are the results empirically adequate uh, and normatively? Are time preferences a good justification for this time discounting? Uh, and do we find that the, uh, that the representation is adequate? Um, and so, so it's, it's, not going to, it's not going to go so well. Uh, so, so let's just uh, start to think about this, right? So, so the first thing is that um, uh, uh, that what we what we say is okay. Discounted utility and time preferences they somehow reflect impatience. Now, uh, I think in all papers in my database of time discounting papers, I have never read more than three consecutive sentences about what impatience actually is or, or what it is supposed to, to, uh, uh, to mean, really. Um, and so I, I, I went back to the, uh, to the Austrians and, and to old sort of capital theory for forerunners. And, and so there we actually get a little bit more of a substantial discussion of what we mean by time impatience. Um, and interestingly enough, even the modern papers, so even the, the papers that are, that are uh, uh, discussing this now, refer basically, you know, for conceptual questions, you know, we, we refer to this. Uh, uh, so this is, this is a little bit how it, uh, how it looks. So here's, here's just a few, uh, a few uh, quotes. So um, the first is by, by, uh, by Ray, and he says, well, the actual presence of the immediate object of desire in the mind by exciting the attention seems to rouse all the faculties, as it were, to fix their view on it and leads them to a very lively conception of the enjoyments which it offers to their instant possession. Uh, then we have uh, Bern Bauwerk who says, uh, we possess inadequate power to imagine and to abstract, uh, or we are not willing to put forth the necessary effort, but in any event we depict a more or less incomplete picture of our future ones and especially of the remotely distant ones. Pigou says, well, it's a type of cognitive illusion. Our telescopic faculty is defective, and we therefore see future pleasures, as it were, on a diminished scale. And Ramsey says, well, it's weakness of imagination. Now, I think all these quotes gesture in vaguely the same direction, but if you actually look at it, uh, then 
then if you really think about what they're saying, uh, 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 it seems that they all have something slightly different in mind. So we, we see some allusion to uh, 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 cognitive motivation, to psychological motivation, also epistemic uh, 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 interpretations of what impatience really means. So it's, it, it, uh, uh, it, seems in, it, it seems to pull in all, so, all sorts of different directions. Um, and so, uh, so let's, let's see what, what we can say, right? So time preferences. So I think they're well founded mathematically. I mean, you know, at least we, we sort of have a representation frame, we have several representation frameworks in which time preferences, uh, uh, you know, we, we know what they are, so that's good. Um, and also, I mean, operationally, it doesn't seem to be such a big problem. So uh, I think for me, it seems easy enough to imagine uh, to offer agents choices between these timed goods, right? So that seems easy enough. If I go to, uh, uh, to, to a lab and I, I, I ask, you know, you want to, do you want to have X at T or Y at, at S? I mean, these seem, these seem to be uh, uh, simple enough questions where we can ask agents and can try to elicit their time preferences. Um, the question is just what it is that uh, we're measuring when we're doing this. Uh, and so there are these unclear appeals to time impatience, as we've just seen. So maybe this is really something that has to do with our cognition, or maybe it's really epistemic that we can't really know what we want. Uh, or maybe it's psychological, or maybe it's really also an ethical judgment we're making. Um, so, so it's not quite clear what the underlying concept is. So what we have at the moment is we have, it makes sense from a mathematical point of view, it makes sense from an operational point of view, but it doesn't really make sense from a conceptual point of view. Um, uh, uh, and even if we were to gloss over this and we say, well, uh, as long as something makes sense behaviorally and as long as it's defined well enough, I don't really mind so much that we don't have a coherent conceptual story. But still then, uh, it's hard to see how this rudimentary time impatience concept which we have here, whether this can really motivate all these different axioms. So it's not only the time impatience axiom that we have to motivate. I mean, that seems simple enough, right? So that, that just seems to be... Uh, oops. Well, where are we here? So the time impatience axiom, that seems to not suffer maybe so much from these conceptual problems, but we also have to, uh, we also have to say why is it rational or empirically adequate to have a, to endorse transitivity and completeness uh, of these of this new object now, uh, uh, because this is not on, this is not a preference anymore. This is now really a time preference, and it's it's a completely different object. So so we need to make we need to motivate all these axioms, and and for that uh, uh, I think this is this is simple, this is something um, which uh, uh, which uh, deserves a uh, a question mark. So what we could do, of course, is we could at this point and. Many a behavioral economist I've talked to does that, endorse operationalism uh, by simply saying, well, if it's behaviorally defined, uh, I just run my experiments and then I find out things and I give you uh, a nicely parameterized uh, uh, discounting function that uh, uh, speaks for itself. And so uh, I'm not so worried about uh, what it all means. But of course, if we're endorsing this, when, then we're losing um, a lot of the folk psychological and um, philosophy of action connections that, that we that we uh, uh, usually uh, are quite uh, happy to uh, to have in our in, in our uh, rational choice theory. So it seems it seems a, a high price to pay uh, uh, if if we uh, if we want to want to stay with these uh, uh, with these kinds of foundations. Um, there's also a sense. Uh, in, in which uh, time preferences maybe as a, cannot really account for the phenomenon of time discounting as a whole. And so this is also something uh, uh, which has been shown experimentally uh, uh, in, in behavioral economics when, when uh, all these uh, uh, choice experiments have been, uh, have been conducted. So um, there, uh, there are a lot of conceptual motivations, empirically speaking, of time discounting uh, that are simply not compatible with time preference axioms. So uh, we have discounting for delay perception of agents. Uh, we uh, 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 also have discounting for uncertainty, but um, there's no way in which I can interpret the time preference axioms uh, in terms of uncertainty, at least not if I also want to have an expected utility uh, theory somewhere. Um, and we also can't really talk about preference change because uh, uh, since we've decided to 
put the discounting, the derivation of the discounting function so close to the utility function, we also have to endorse stable preferences. So, um, so regardless or not of whether you share this earlier skepticism about, well, maybe this time impatience idea seems, seems a bit unclear, there's also a sense in which um, uh, uh, not only theoretically or conceptually, but also uh, empirically, uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that time discounting is a bit more complex than just, uh, 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 just reflecting a time impatience, and uh, uh, that it also has to do with preference change, if you think back uh, to the draft problem, for instance. So that is something that, uh, uh, where this model is definitely pushed a little bit uh, uh, to, its, uh, to its limits. So, so this is uh, so this is where where I want to leave the uh, want to leave the DU model for a moment and uh, uh, and just talk a little bit about these other uh, uh, models of uh, of discounting. Um, so this hyperbolic discounting uh, uh, in in particular. So what we what we've seen in the beginning we have these so we have the thick line that's sort of the exponential discounting function and what we have with hyperbolic discounting functions they kind of fall a little bit more uh, steeply here and then they then they flatten out in, in roughly the same way so um, there's uh, I mean hyperbolic discounting or discounting in general is, is part of uh, of the success story of behavioral economics in a sense. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, we've heard about loss aversion already today and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and ambiguity, but there's also uh, uh, tons of experiments uh, uh, run on, on uh, discounting and the, the different hyperbolic discounting functions are, uh, uh, are really coming out of, uh, uh, of that. It's, it started uh, with Ainsley in, in 75 and uh, so all the contributions that have been made uh, in, in the last uh, 40 years or so are uh, brilliantly reviewed in this Frederick et al. 2002 and the Doyle paper 2013 uh, where, where they simply go through well basically all the experiments that have been uh, conducted um, uh, to, to find out what, how, how real world agents discount. So what hyperbolic discounting functions uh, do is they characterize uh, three different time horizons of a decision maker. So one is the present and immediate, so that's given full weight. Sometimes that's more than just now, that's also, maybe sometimes it's also tomorrow. Um, then uh, these uh, functions uh, cover the horizon, so that's uh, where you do, uh, uh, where, where, the, where the discounting factors are much more sharply declining between the different periods, um, and then the far future in which uh, the discounting uh, factors are, are very similar. And so uh, uh, here's a few popular ones. So uh, here's uh, the, the 1 over t function again. That's very, it's a very easy one. Um, and so uh, in this function, then the present and immediate are the periods 0 and 1. Uh, and then the horizon, which starts after 1, the, disc the discounting factor, factor is already sharply declining, right? So for instance, if you uh, so the discounting factor for zero is one, and then for two it's already 0 0.5, and for three it's already uh, point, uh, uh, point 0.3, and then in the far future, uh, discounting factors uh, are really similar between the different uh, different periods. And this is, if we think back to the Apple example, this is also how you get it, right? That you do not really discount, uh, 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 that there's not a big difference between this discounting the, between the uh, uh, 999th day and the 1000th day, but there's of course a strong difference between discounting between today uh, and tomorrow. So this is this is one explanation of how oh, this is this is the way in which hyperbolic discounting captures uh, the idea that we want the one apple now uh, and then uh, for later time points the, the two uh, uh, the two apples later. So. Uh, so here's a, a few other uh, functions. So we have exponential discounting uh, again, but then you have this delay discounting, and then you have various other. So here we combine a delay uh, factor with a discount rate, uh, and here you have what's called generalized discounting, and here you have quasi-hyperbolic discounting. So all these are different parametrizations based on uh, observed uh, choice behavior in the lab. So we, we make experiments, and then we simply see what kind of curve uh, fits best and, and that's, the, that's, the discounting, uh, uh, that's the discounting research in behavioral economics uh, 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 that, uh, that we try to find the best fitting curve that, uh, uh, that really uh, captures uh, enough what's, uh, what's going on. Um, there's also a few theoretical frameworks in hyperbolic discounting. 
But uh, 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 so we have very little by way of representation theorems. Uh, there's one uh, uh, in 2007 by Orkin Mazatlioglu. Uh, what they do is to capture hyperbolic discounting axiomatically. They basically do the same thing that uh, uh, we do in the Koopmans, Fishburne, Rubinstein uh, 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 discounted utility representation, but then they add a time domain and they say, uh, what agents also do is they order time points according to how they perceive the delay on these, uh, 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 on these time points, and so this is then what is supposed to capture an agent's delay perception. So there we also have an axiomatic derivation of, uh, uh, of discounted utility. So what's interesting, apart from uh, uh, finding out what the correct shape of the discounting function is, uh, is also that here in, in behavioral economics we now have a great, greater variety of motivations for time discounting. Um, so we've already seen time and patience. So there uh, you have a few uh, uh, behavioral economists who say, well, maybe impatience is declining. Right, so in the in the standard DU model, uh, uh, impatience was supposed to be stable, and now here uh, we can also say impatience uh, is declining. You have then this idea that delay perception, so how significant do I perceive delays when I wait for something, is important. Um, uh, there's also the question of risk and uncertainty, um, and then there's also the question about preference change. Uh, 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 and, and dynamic choices, as we've, uh, as we've seen uh, it in, the, in this uh, draft problem. Um, another way to get, uh, to, to get uh, uh, foundations for, uh, for hyperbolic discounting is also to uh, perceive of the decision maker as uh, different temporal selves over time, uh, which then are in, a, in an interaction, uh, so there are, there are bargaining models which are supposed to, uh, supposed to capture that. Um, and so, so that is that is a different way in which uh, uh, in, in which uh, uh, we make, we can make sense of the hyperbolic discounting function. Um, I, I think I, I I say a few words about these multi selves models. So uh, so this is something that started with uh, Strotz in '56, uh, uh, and then there's a, a number of other papers. Uh, uh, also with Ainsley again and Schelling, uh, that really apply this idea that there are different selves uh, uh, to intertemporal dis the decision making. And so the idea uh, of these different selves would roughly be something along the lines of that here I have sort of a scholarly self and a hedonic self, and that then maybe these different selves have different, uh, 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 have placed different importance to, uh, uh, on these options, but that they also have different time horizons, and then you can model, uh, 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 a, uh, then you can model game theoretically a bargaining situation between, uh, between these different selves in order to arrive, uh, to, to, to in order to arrive at a hyperbolic discounting function. So, just uh, one uh, one variant of that is uh, is this idea that we have uh, that we have a dual self model where one self is supposed to be the planner and the other self is supposed to be the doer, um, and uh, so this is uh, this is a paper by Taylor and Sheffrin. There are now plenty of other papers uh, 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 that uh, that that model this uh, referenced uh, here. Um, but so the idea is that. Taylor and Sheffrin say, well, maybe there are certain things that uh, uh, individuals do to themselves in order to uh, constrain, uh, uh, constrain the doer selves uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from doing the, the short-term hedonic thing. So if I have a, a planner self that, could, that, that has access to certain resources, certain self-binding resources uh, that, uh, uh, that can constrain the doer selves from uh, 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 from messing up uh, the uh, maximizing lifetime utility. Um, so what they say is here, well, the doer can be given discretion, in which case either his preferences must be modified or his incentives must be altered, or the doer's set of choices may instead be limited by imposing rules that change the constraints the doer faces. Right? So in other words, we're, we're trying to find out what sort of techniques are, are there by which we can uh, uh, by which we can uh, have uh, have the planner getting the upper hand uh, over the over the doer, and so this sort of uh, heavily loaded uh, uh, language is, is employed quite freely uh, in this in this literature that we that we have these different uh, that we have these different selves, um, and that uh, they get assigned different roles. So in this case, the planner and the doer, and that that's how 
uh, uh, how hyperbolic discounting is motivated, or that that's what hyperbolic discounting, in a sense, summarizes, right? That uh, uh, the hyperbolic discounting function summarizes the interaction between a planner uh, and, a, and a doer. Um, and so here's a, here's a, a successful uh, self-binding uh, action. So this is the story of Ulysses and the sirens uh, who... Uh, 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 who has himself b bound to the mast so that he's not going to stay on the island of the, of the sirens. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so this is a, a successful action of self-binding, quite literally in this, in, in this example, um, in, order to, uh, uh, in, in order to have the, the planner self getting, getting the upper hand. Um, so what to... I mean, what to conclude from, from this, this, uh, this discounted utility uh, developments is uh, it's still quite hard to say. I, I suppose the, 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 the major development uh, concerning time discounting in economics is the, is the following, that we started with this discounted utility model uh, uh, and it's still very valued because it's very simple and because, uh, 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 because it requires very little of extra work. Uh, and that then hyperbolic discounting is mainly valued as uh, uh, is mainly valued as something that captures uh, a certain empirical uh, uh, certain empirical phenomena uh, much uh, much better. But I suppose also uh, uh, where we have to be a bit careful is whether these hyperbolic discounting functions. I mean, it's still just one function. Whether it really adequately summarizes the complexity. Uh, uh, of intertemporal uh, of intertemporal choices. So, if you go back to the the, the draft problem, uh, the question really is whether um, uh, you want to whether you want to summarize the different kinds of motivations that may uh, compel a decision maker to go one way or another in this decision tree uh, by this one function that says, well, it's just because you're valuing the future in a certain way that you're acting like this. Um, so, so that is that is something that. Uh, 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 is is very much uh, is very much an open uh, an open question. Um, I uh, was planning to do a little bit more than I think I will have time to do. So I think I, I inadvertently also did some time discounting when uh, when planning this. So I, it turns out that I uh, uh, discounted general foundations. But but I I, I suppose I still have sort of. Uh, five minutes. Uh, so I, I do think I want to give you at least a flavor of what I think would be uh, an interesting way to, to improve uh, uh, theorizing uh, about, uh, about uh, time discounting here. So one thing that uh, I think is worrying uh, both conceptually but also formally is that in the DU model uh, we have this entanglement of time and utility. Um, so we're just what we're doing is we we, we take uh, a stand a version of a standard framework of how we derive utility and we uh, change it ever so slightly by adding the time dimension explicitly and then uh, uh, that that is how uh, how we get our our discounting function uh, uh, and so um, what the worry here is that we in doing so we are basically pumping intuitions about preferences in order to motivate time preferences, right? So for instance, for uh, uh, preferences over outcomes, it's quite natural that we say maybe a transitivity condition uh, uh, captures something about rationality, but the question is to what extent that really translates over to, uh, uh, to, uh, to time. I suppose if there's passage of time, uh, uh, there's always a way in which I could be intransitive uh, because there's so many things that can happen over time. Um, and likewise with the other axioms, it seems to me that um, it seems to me that uh, uh, it's, it's it's an unhelpful way of thinking about this issue uh, and about the role of uh, of time uh, when we uh, uh, when we uh, uh, entangle it so so closely. Um, another problem, of course, with time preferences is that they really require stable preferences. And I mean, as some of the examples I've, I've shown uh, suggest is that preference change is also an important part of. Uh, 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 of, of what, uh, what happens in intertemporal decision making, and it makes it quite hard to uh, distinguish between changes in preferences and changes in attitudes to time. So, uh, uh, 
do I observe a certain behavior or do I capture, capture something that uh, happens because uh, uh, an agent has a certain attitude to, uh, to the time difference or is it uh, the utility difference? That is also something which is not, um, uh, which is not quite uh, clear when we're, uh, when, we're, when we're putting these two things together in this way. Um, and so here's another way to, to think about this, that we say, okay, suppose we start really with this idea that we have utility and we want to weight utility. And so one area in which we do this is uh, uh, with probabilities, right? So we uh, uh, talk about probability functions all the time and apply them to, uh, 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 to, to weightings. But it's interesting that when we are weighting utility with discounting factors, we uh, have uh, decided to go to, to, to follow a completely different strategy in deriving uh, these functions. So discounting functions are implied in the derivation of discounted utility, whereas probability functions are separate derivations uh, and there are separate interpretations of probability available and then at some point we can combine them with a utility function and we then we obtain expected utility. Um, so these are two completely, completely different strategies. This is not to uh, uh, deny that there are also ways in which probabilities and utilities uh, 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 are motivated uh, with each other in some frameworks. Um, but uh, if we also think about the talks we heard this morning about risk and ambiguity and uncertainty, it seems to me that uh, uh, one advantage of such a modeling strategy of keeping utility and probability derivation separate is that we then can explore the ways in which they interact. Whereas uh, in the uh, discounted utility model, we sort of get the interaction already within the axioms, and that, uh, that, seems, to, that seems to me uh, a, a, a fairly problematic uh, thing to do. At least it suggests to me that we should also explore, uh, explore other, uh, other things. Um, and so I think uh, I shouldn't really go into uh, uh, explaining how, uh, how it works, but one, uh, one, uh, one uh, thing I, I do want to say is that uh, what a general representation framework can look like is if we say, okay, we start by this general time discounting function and without assuming anything about utilities, we try to derive non-trivially uh, what kinds of qualitative relations or what kind of orderings would we have to have in place uh, and what kinds of motivations can we attach to these, uh, to these orderings. Um, so I don't know how we're doing for time. Maybe we should, uh, we should simply uh, 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 wrap up very quickly. So I just uh, see whether there's a, uh, there are some conclusions. Right. Uh, so I suppose the general message here is that uh, despite the uh, uh, staggering importance of time discounting and all sorts of applications, there's not a lot of uh, work done on exploring different uh, strategies of, uh, uh, of deriving uh, uh, these functions. We have mainly the discounted utility models that are used as a baseline model. We have a bunch of empirical work uh, uh, for hyperbolic discounting, and uh, that's basically it. Um, a similar situation we have in social decision making uh, with a social discount rate framework. So in a sense, I hope this uh, overview of the uh, philosophical problems behind uh, time discounting may motivate a few of you to just you know, do, do some nice formal work in this area. There, there's, uh, there's a bit of a lack of competition in uh, terms of uh, what are good uh, derivations for these uh, time discounting uh, functions. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Conrad. Other questions? Sure. Thanks. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, that might be a very stupid question, so tell me if it is. I don't see actually any really good reason for which, obvious reason for which the discounted utility should be decreasing or monotonically, actually. So, I mean, I, I've got to mechanisms, uh, for instance, once for pleasure. So the fact that when you delay the pleasure, then usually the pleasure is, is greater. So actually, you could have a maximum somewhere uh, in time. And it's a bit the same with the pain. Forecasting pain is a pain by itself. So so might, you might want to to have the pain earlier. I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that, that, that's, uh, that's one of, so, so that's, uh, uh, I mean, the only thing you can you can say here is that 
Um, uh, I mean, again, I think I think the the the, the main answer to 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 that uh, to that question is that. Um, the, uh, we simply don't have enough conceptual motivation for the axioms in the discounted utility model to even debate that question adequately. Uh, uh, so so that, that, is, that is a problem. And I do think that one thing you can say is, of course, that on average, in general, it might be that uh, nice things we want to have earlier and bad things we want to delay, but of course, uh, getting it over with or pleasures of anticipation uh, are also salient in, in, some, some, uh, uh, in some walks of life. And so the only thing I can say is that this is also part of what uh, experimental work has shown in hyperbolic discounting, that they have, uh, uh, there, are, there are these kinds of experiments where they have uh, studied this phenomenon and have, have found that, that that's yet another uh, uh, deviation from the, uh, from the discounted uh, utility model. And, and I think all I can say is, uh, 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 in, a, in a more general sense is that um, this project of time discounting really is to find uh, to find something uh, to find some concept that non-trivially can lend itself to motivate this and so it has to be something which uh, behaves quite regularly with regards to time uh, and so maybe time and patience isn't quite general enough. Uh, maybe there are other concepts uh, such as uncertainty or a certain kind of preference change that uh, lends itself to it, um, but uh, uh, I doubt uh, that it actually, uh, that there are actually these, these, uh, these very, very general features that we, that we want to, want to uh, encapsulate in such a function. What is known about uh, the evolutionary foundations of, uh, of time preferences? I mean, I, I can think of, of, of different uh, evolutionary forces that uh, shape time preferences and these forces, and, and it may be the case that the time preferences that the majority of the population has now are not anymore, you know, uh, yeah. adaptive, I, like, you know, I guess the role of, of, of uh, saving and investment has increased and it has become more important in the, in the recent uh, you know, centuries. But uh, maybe you know, many thousand, thousand years ago, uh, it, people who you know, enjoyed whatever kind of you know, sex and food earlier could reproduce faster, so. Right, I mean, I think I think that's I think that's it's a nice uh, question because I also think it uh, uh, touches on on the supposed generality that we try to achieve with such time discounting because I, I can think uh, uh, in if we think of our current Western societies I think there's quite some domains of life where uh, 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 low time discounting really uh, is is priced I mean the longer you stay in education and the harder you work today the more prices uh, society has, uh, has for you, in a sense. Uh, but then there's also uh, other parts of life where it seems that uh, uh, instant gratification is really uh, what it's all about. Uh, so it seems, so again, I think what we, what we want from time discounting seems such a general thing uh, that uh, also the kinds of things you're mentioning, I think we, uh, we might have, if we want to be empirically adequate, there might be lots of time discounting functions. But then the question is, whether it still makes sense to speak of time discounting if I distinguish my time discounting functions for different uh, domains and different areas. Um, so, so one more general way of making this point is that I, I, I also think that uh, one could take from this to, to simply not talk about time discounting anymore, but rather uh, 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 either have a utility function and exploit the generality of the utility function in various ways, but if really factoring out the time domain, um, it's maybe a bit too general. I was actually going to make a question similar to this one, and so now it's more of a comment. I thought that uh, when you were talking about that the, the, the EU model doesn't account for um, 
preference uh, for changing uncertainty or changing preferences, etc. I was thinking that actually, for me, it makes much more uh, sense to think of a discount rate as something that uh, uh, is translating that uncertainty we have about the future. So we discount because we're not sure that tomorrow will come, and an apple today is right. better because we're not sure that tomorrow right, will right, come. Right. And I was thinking that I cannot conceive of impatience as anything else than the product of uh, that uncertainty, not only regarding future states of the world, but also regarding future states of uncertainty, regarding future states of the self. So I feel like it might have um, existed some evolutionary pressure uh, resulting from that uncertainty precisely into this impatience. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. that could, I don't know, I have no right, idea. No, that's, I mean, thanks. I mean, that's certainly also a line that uh, is uh, very popular in mainstream economics. So I mean, the, the one conceptual remark you find in the whole Maskell Winston Green uh, microeconomic theory textbook is that time, and pref time preference is probably related to uncertainty about the future. Um, and so also if we look at some of those, uh, uh, those quotes from the, from the uh, early uh, capital theorists, you can also see how uh, there are some epistemic interpretations uh, uh, that, and then you can say maybe time and patience is the manifestation of a certain epistemic condition that we have. Um, I think that's worth exploring. The only problem is that the discounted utility model cannot be interpreted in this way. Um, uh, or at least if you do, uh, uh, you run into many problems. Because if you say that individual options or individual consumption programs are preferred uh, uh, because of the kind of uncertainty that is attached to them because they happen at a certain point, um, then uh, if you do that, uh, you already uh, where well, you're already representing things that normally your probability function represents. So uh, you'd have to, I mean, it's, it's a non-trivial task to find a representation of uncertainty about the future via a time discounting function that can be used in conjunction with a standard probability function. Uh, uh, I think that's an interesting project, uh, but you can't, uh, you can't simply you can't simply say it uh, about the existing uh, framework. You'd, you'd have to, uh, yeah, you'd have to derive it. But it's it's something that a lot of people say. Well, we discount because we're uncertain about the future. But there's no representation theorem backing that up. So when you were when you were talking, I was trying to think of a thought experiment uh, that would abstract away from because there are all side issues uncertainty, but then there are also, so uncertainty is one, but also market considerations, like right. I might want to have all the money now because I know how to, uh, I know how to invest right. the money yeah. and get a better flow than what you are proposing. So the problem is that there are so many uh, external factors that to get a pure theory of time preference, you have to find a setup where you abstract away from all these. And probably in right. such a setup, uh, then it becomes a normative appealing to not to have uh, such a discounting. So I can see that, because then you have start away again from uncertainty, for example, because if you have uncertainty, we are in task and you know the carpe diem, uh, no? Mm -hmm. If there is strong uncertainty, then I prefer to have everything today. Uh, it's a separate issue from a pure time preference, no? But not a, if yeah, I so make clear, so you want, because then it's perfectly rational to discount everything. But, sorry, when is it? Uh, uh, if there irrational? is uncertainty, if you the, if there is uncertainty, then uh, the claim, uh, the, for example, you're mentioning people say you shouldn't be, uh, you should be different across uh, having the same uh, good across time makes yeah. sense in a pure the, a pure theory of time preference. If you abstract away from Again, uncertainty, markets, all these. Because once they come into the picture, then everything becomes uh, right. uh, more complicated. And not saying that it's not important. Uh, just uh, I first try to address uh, that, and then I would try right. to enrich. Uh, right, but even I mean, even even then, uh, so even so, so suppose we're not interested in probability. We ju we just say so we live in a world of full certainty, but we still want to discount the future for uncertainty. Uh, and now we want to interpret the discounted utility framework in this way, what you'd be forced to say is things like, I prefer x at s over y at t, um, and I know all, I mean, I know what these options entail, right? I know everything about x and y, 
but then there's some time uncertainty uh, that makes me have that preference. And that, I mean, that's. This is a further issue. I'm saying that uh, no, one no, should try to isolate uh, short of a pure time preference uh, without any uncertainty. Without, and then hopefully it is uh, combines with other elements in a richer oh. theory. Because otherwise, everything uh, is you know, mixed up and is hard to have. You know, that's my feeling, but I don't know. Right. So, that's so, my when you, uh, as a so when you say about isolating pure time preference, so would you say that so this discounted utility model, that that successfully does that? Was that the implication? Or? Right. No, I, I agree. I, yeah, sure. No, no. I, I, I agree that I, I agree that that would be an important uh, task. But you have to, uh, but you have to have. Uh, I mean, in order to motivate a time discounting function, uh, you'd have to motivate some representation framework with that. Um, it's something that I think with with a general representation framework that I have might be possible. But um, but it's I think uh, I mean you're. Triviality is, is only one step uh, one step away because you want I mean you want to abstract from so many things and you only want to say something about time uh, and uh, uh, I think the conclusion that that many people say is that actually there's nothing purely about time that we really can or want to say it's always going to be uh, a specific role that time plays and to cash that out uh, yeah we still need to need to do uh, uh, a lot more work than we're, than, uh, than we're doing now. I'm very sorry to have to jump in this very interesting. And there, are, there are more questions momentarily silenced. So uh, I would like to thank Conrad again.